Good morning, and welcome to our third uh, presentation this morning. Um, let me introduce our last speaker. Um, uh, Professor Tony Denzer is an architectural historian, and he's in the Department of Civil and Architectural Engineering. Uh, it's somewhat difficult to be an architectural historian. You have to have a foot in two camps, architecture and history, and when you're at the PhD level, um, you have to sort of know something, you know, that's sort of what the title means. Uh, so uh, he's a, uh, Dr. Denzer is a very good architect, he's also a very good historian, but if you actually push a little harder, you begin to realize that it isn't two camps. Uh, I was thinking last night it was four camps, uh, architecture, history, engineering, and something I'm going to call sort of the natural world of the sun and the wind and weather and the climate. And then it was pointed out to me this morning that, of course, architecture in many universities is in the art side of campus. And so that he's actually got five legs. There's a, the art history leg as well. Um, metaphorically speaking, of course. Um, after getting his PhD in, uh, from UCLA in 2005, uh, Tony Denzer uh, came straight to the university. Um, he's been uh, quite an active uh, teacher, researcher, uh, participant in community activities, both locally and statewide and on a national basis. Uh, he's a board member for the American Solar Energy Society. He is a founding board member of the Wyoming chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council. Um, he's done numerous articles, books, presentations. Let me just give you a couple of my favorites. Uh, Passive House and Net Zero Energy Residential Designs in a Cold Climate. Um, he also has written on sustainable construction in Yellowstone Park. and. Uh, recently gave, was a panel member uh, for The Greenest House is One Already Built. In 2013, <laughs> in 2013, he published his second book, The Solar House, Pioneering Sustained, Sustainable Design. Uh, and that's going to provide the focus for his talk today. I give you Dr. Denzer. Thank you, Paul. That's a really awesome uh, introduction. I'm flattered. I'm really grateful uh, to be invited to, to Saturday U, and so it's, it's, a, it's a real privilege to, to speak to you today. Thank you to all of the organizers, and thank you all, uh, of course, for coming out when you could be snowboarding. <clears throat> So I've titled the talk The Solar House Then and Now. I think I'm going to spend a lot more time talking about then, and we can uh, glimpse now at the end and maybe chat about that uh, a bit afterwards. But the overarching theme of the talk, I think, is that if you were to set out and build a solar house now or, or a green building uh, of any kind, you would be certainly standing on the shoulders of uh, many other people in the earlier uh, part of the 20th century who started to explore these ideas and understand the scientific principles of building energy use in a time when uh, that was not a, a necessary or popular thing to do because uh, energy was very cheap. <clears throat> so as Paul said, I published this book uh, last year after working on it for about six years and so yeah it took a lot of <laughs> reading and visits to archives and interviewing uh, people and what I really set out to do in the book was to examine the idea of solar architecture prior to 1973 and there were a lot of well, I, I shouldn't say a lot. There were a limited number of experimental uh, works of solar architecture before 1973. 
And so I felt like I could really cover all of those in a comprehensive way. After 1973, and as I'm sure you know, that was kind of a tipping point for building energy use. Uh, after 1973, it was just going to be impossible for me to, to talk about everything because it was so suddenly uh, widespread and common. So maybe that's a, another project for, for the future, maybe for somebody else. <laughs> if you'll permit, I'm just going to kick off by reading the first couple of sentences of the uh, introduction. The label solar house typically conjures an image, I think, from the 1970s, an eccentrically shaped structure with an oversized sloped glass wall, diagonal cedar siding, perhaps an earth berm or a Volkswagen van nearby. <laughs> and this image is not false. After 1973, the solar house became both a mass cultural movement and an authentic architectural style rooted in technological developments and in some degree to the aesthetics of the counterculture. But this image is incomplete because it obscures the rich history of experimental solar houses before the 1970s and that has been overlooked both by architects and historians. So the aim of the book is to, to go back earlier than the 1970s and kind of reconstruct uh, the history of the solar house. The book looks both at what we now call passive and active systems. Um, for passive solar houses, the techniques that you would use today are basically identical to those that were established in the 1930s and 40s. Here's a hypothetical solar house for Wyoming by Bunk Porter. Not built as far as I know. But uh, Porter did basically everything right here. He made a, a kind of linear floor plan with all of the major rooms facing south, or slightly inflected to the southeast in this case. Uh, so a linear floor plan, rooms facing south, used a lot of glass on that south wall and a very limited amount of glass uh, on the other three sides. By the way, that and the type of glass was kind of critical to the development of the solar house. This was double pane insulated glass, which was a new product on the market at the time. Prior to double pane insulated glass, the solar house was an energy loser because whatever you gained during the day would be uh, far outweighed by the losses at night. So that was a key technology in this story. And then the third element that, that Porter got right here was when you put all that glass on the south, you want to provide shade uh, so that the house doesn't overheat uh, in the summer. Uh, so I'm zooming out now, and, he, and Porter uh, describes these things in the text to the left. And, but by the way, he was not a solar architect. He, that wasn't his specialty. He wasn't prominent in this field. Um, but he knew how to do these things in 1944 or 45 um, because by this time it was already a widely published and well understood uh, set of principles. <clears throat> and he did a good job. Uh, if, if this house was ever built, uh, I, would, I would certainly like to know about it and I would believe uh, that it would have saved about uh, 20 or 30 percent on the heating bills just by doing those simple things. So why did Bunk Porter in 1944-45 design a hypothetical solar house that was never built? Well, he was asked to do that by Libby Owens Ford, the glass company. They asked uh, 49 architects, one for each state at the time, plus District of Columbia. So they picked an architect from each state and asked and said, design a solar house for your home state. We're going to build each of them and we're going to publish uh, the designs. They didn't end up building any of them, but they did publish uh, 
this book, <clears throat> which they called Your Solar House, um, certainly a promotional effort. Glass companies had a, a kind of vested interest in solar houses. Uh, they thought they would, they, they said they would sell acres of glass if the solar house caught on. And it did, and they did. Um, so this is, this, is, this is an advertisement, but it's also a kind of fascinating snapshot of what the solar house was uh, in its kind of earliest uh, part of its gestation. Uh, so you flip through this book, and uh, as I mentioned, Bunk Porter for Wyoming did everything right. A lot of the other architects didn't. Uh, they didn't grasp the concept yet, especially those in warm states. Um, where solar heating maybe isn't the biggest priority. So, and they all had different ideas about style. So it's a, it's a kind of curious episode and, and part, of, uh, part of what I do in the book is, is try to interpret what, what was going on at this time. But th maybe the larger point is that the solar house was a thing. The name existed, it was a popular concept and lots of people uh, in the 1940s uh, wanted one. <clears throat> so how did Bunk Porter kind of know what to do in 1944-45? Well, frankly, because of this man, George Fred Keck, called himself Fred. And I call him in the book the first solar Architect, and there's two whole chapters dedicated to Fred Keck, and I, I think he's just a tremendously significant figure to 20th century architecture in general. So he built a series of houses beginning in the 1930s, uh, exploring this idea of just passively letting the sun come in and warm the house. Uh, and those earlier experiments were uh, sometimes hits, sometimes misses, sometimes kind of clunky, but they all led up to this house, the Sloan House uh, in 1940. Glenview is a suburb of Chicago. And this is where Keck established that, that kind of standard pattern for the solar house I was just describing, a linear floor plan, one room deep, so every room in the house faces south. It's very long and shallow. Lots of glass on that south face, and then very little on the other three faces. Every orientation except south, even well-insulated glass will lose more heat in a 24-hour period than it will admit. Um, so they, they knew that then. A lot of architects don't understand that now. <laughs> So the linear plan, the proper orientation and use of glass, use of insulated double pane glass. I think this first Sloan house was double pane. He's gonna start using triple pane in a couple of years. Um, and then the, the overhangs, the overhanging roof uh, to provide proper shading for the, for the high summer sun. So this was a really, you know, this was um, where kind of Keck brought all of his knowledge uh, together for the first time, but this is also a really significant canonical house in history, although you won't find it in history books, maybe that'll change soon, uh, because it was the first time this phrase, solar house, uh, was used in the Chicago Tribune. Howard Sloan, the owner, was a pretty savvy PR guy. He was a real estate developer. Um, and so he kind of conspired with the Tribune, hey, put my house in the newspaper, let's call it a solar house. And this, this is the, uh, uh, I, I did a lot of digging and this is the first time that phrase was ever used uh, to my knowledge. <clears throat> Uh, by the way, Keck was trained uh, not as an architect, but as an architectural engineer, which is a peculiar and, and remains a very kind of small field uh, today. But he, 
brought a lot of technical knowledge uh, to the table. And in fact, for the Sloan House, he was able to calculate how much solar heat would come in over the course of the day and how much would be lost uh, at night. This was the first time ever, uh, I believe, that anybody ran such calculations. And he told Howard Sloan, you're going to save 30% on your heating bills. And uh, that was conservative. Sloan ended up saving 40%. <clears throat> Just by those uh, simple passive techniques. <clears throat> now, I mentioned this idea of shading. What Keck discovered ra rather quickly was that heating is the easy part, cooling is uh, the more difficult part. And by cooling, I mean keeping the sun out when it is not wanted. So his, his earlier experiments in the 1930s, he was heating houses like crazy with the sun, but they were, they were too hot, especially in the summer or in the, in the swing seasons. So uh, he understood from the beginning that, that, that it is essential to the passive solar house that you have proper shading in it. So he began, he, he, he learned that he had to understand solar geometry and he started drawing diagrams like this. These were the first, this was the first time in 1937 an architect ever drew a diagram like this in the history of architecture. And it's of course de rigueur today for architects and engineering students to, to learn this stuff. But Prior to the 1930s, this was, uh, um, if it was known, it was known kind of more through intuition than through science. So I, I, I think Keck was the first person to understand kind of the modern science of solar heating. Again, all of these same principles apply today, and you can walk into architecture schools today and see students making drawings just like this. Uh, Keck and Sloan the, so, so became a team then. So I mentioned Sloan was a, a real estate developer, so he developed uh, whole areas outside of Chicago. This is called Solar Park, and one of these streets uh, is called Solar Lane, and it remains so called uh, today. Uh, built in the, again, in the uh, early 1940s, just before. Uh, we got into World War II. What's maybe kind of fascinating here is that, so it shows that th there needs to be, in it, to do this well, there needs to be a real sympathy between architecture and urban planning because if the houses are gonna be uh, facing south and one room deep, they're gonna be very wide. So this required 100 foot wide lots. Um, and that's not, uh, necessarily how city planners lay out subdivisions. But Sloan did. Okay, so at the same time all of that is going on, architecture in general, I mean Keck is a um, exceptional person, but the mainstream uh, of modern, kind of cutting edge modern architecture is going in uh, this direction fascinated with glass, but not using glass in a kind of critical, selective manner, just making uh, all glass houses. Uh, this is, yeah, some of you recognize, I'm sure, the Farnsworth House by Mies van der Rohe. <clears throat> and these are acknowledged uh, d disasters in terms of both comfort and energy use. Uh, so, and using tons of energy on, uh, in particular on air conditioning, but on, on heating too. So th the mood uh, in general through the 1940s and 50s in architecture is that we can uh, mechanically control the environment. We don't um, care about the temperature outside or controlling the sun because the air conditioner can handle that. So Fred Keck is uh, 
coming at this from a, a kind of critical but very pragmatic or <laughs> practical <laughs> point of view. He had, he had a very folksy way of, of talking uh, about these things. <clears throat> but the, the glass house and the solar house are really almost opposed uh, in, in concept. <clears throat> and so uh, the evolution of Keck houses is really fascinating. He, after the first Sloan house, he, he builds the Duncan house and he, uh, the heating part he has right. He just needs to provide more shading so he develops uh, these vertical, they're called wing walls and they had adjustable veins uh, within them and the, because when the house is gonna overheat is actually late in the afternoon when the sun is kind of coming in sideways. <clears throat> uh, this house had radiant uh, floor heating. Um, he understood pretty quickly that solar and radiant floors are, are sort of best friends and again, remain so today. <clears throat> the Duncan House is also significant for a couple of other reasons. He, he teamed up with the glass company Libby Owens Ford to turn this house into an actual science experiment. So Libby Owens Ford funded a year long study where they fully instrumented the house and had a graduate student uh, come by every day and take measurements and recordings and to, to prove and quantify that th this worked. They were a little bit conservative, I think, in their conclusions, but they said that, again, just doing these simple things would, uh, in this case, they said 20% savings on heating. <clears throat> and by the way, Duncan was a sociologist at the University of Chicago, part of the Chicago, famous Chicago school, and he wrote about living in the house, and he said this, uh, that the house was, the, the solar house, he said, is a place of greater intellectual and spiritual fulfillment in the tradition of Thoreau. So there becomes uh, quickly, I mean, the solar house, remember, did not exist as a thing uh, two years earlier. So already there's a kind of larger intellectual discourse about what it means to live in a solar house. More refinements, uh, Howard Sloan uh, commissioned a, a second house for himself. Um, Keck uh, refines and refines and refines, especially concentrating on that south wall. So you can see the shading uh, outside the wall triple pane glass in this case, um, fixed glass because if the windows had to open, then you had to have insect screens and that would block the solar gain. So he put these, uh, what are called ventilating louvers underneath the glass. That's so you can let in fresh air. Um, ventilating louvers were quite popular in, in 1940s architecture because of Keck. It also allowed you to let fresh air in when you weren't home and not compromise security, I guess. Oh, and the other thing you can't see here is, so the Duncan house had radiant floor heating with a uh, hot water system connected to a boiler. Um, here, he had a floor made out of hollow clay tiles hooked up to a furnace, so hot air was moved beneath the floor but then assisted by the, the sun. So the sun, you know, um, the furnace has to do less work uh, if the floor is already hot. So there begins to be an understanding of thermal mass and lag time. That stuff doesn't end up getting quantified until the 1960s, but they, they get it at least uh, conceptually. And then the next and maybe final step for Fred Keck was uh, prefabrication. So another big theme of 1940s architecture was making, uh, or at least exploring how to make houses in a factory. Um, so he worked with uh, a, a, a builder named Ed Green uh, in Rockford, Illinois. And so this is the coming together of the solar house and the prefabricated house. 
and um, again, the south facing glass, little glass on the other three facades, uh, ventilation above and below the glass in this case, the shading, the wing walls, uh, the hollow clay floors. And the other element that we're not quite seeing here is that the flat roof uh, now uh, has a one inch deep pool of water uh, for summer cooling. And Keck knew that it, just by putting a little thin sheet of water on the roof, you would save 80% on your uh, cooling costs. And that also remains true today. The most advanced green buildings in the world today use um, water-cooled roofs. Again, there's a larger kind of promotional effort kicking in in the mid-40s, and CAC works directly with Libby Owens Ford, so they start uh, putting out, this is a, I think, 16 or 24 page booklet for consumers and it's answering questions. What is a solar house? Um, and the three principles I've been telling you about. Um, orientation to the south, uh, proper amount of glass, and uh, the critical third element, the shading. <clears throat> so, uh, in fact, if we circle back to the question, how did Bunk Porter know what to do in Wyoming? It, it, it's because of this and because Fred Keck worked with uh, Libby Owens Ford in this, in this kind of promotional uh, effort. Now, I don't want to be too um, cynical about Libby Owens Ford because they really did tremendous things, both in terms of education and in terms of uh, research. So they distributed uh, things like this to architects, the, the new tools to uh, made available that, that basically educated architects in how they can uh, calculate the proper angles for their location and so forth. This came out in 1951. Prior to this, you would not know as an architect how to, how to, do, uh, how to properly uh, compute the solar geometry for your location. Libby uh, worked with Purdue University uh, in 1944 to build two identical houses side by side, one solar and one ordinary. Um, and as I mentioned, they, they also financed that research at the Duncan House. So they were really interested in um, developing the science and developing the, the technical understanding of this stuff. Uh, this experiment was kind of screwed up, so they uh, it ended up being kind of inconclusive. <clears throat> and uh, they were very disappointed about that, of course. So, uh, and other people start getting involved, uh, universities and so forth. Uh, so there's a broader effort to understand the science of solar heating and broadcast it, communicate it to uh, not only architects, but also to homeowners. This was University of Illinois extension service, um, creating literature and like this and distributing it. Frank Lloyd Wright uh, joined the movement uh, in solar houses, right, again, four years after the thing had a name. Um, and already it's a popular and widespread trend. House Beautiful said in 1943 that hundreds of solar houses had been built nationwide. In Rockford, Ed Green built over 100 of these. Um, so Keck was, was quite successful. When near his death, Keck said he had built 300 solar houses. Anyway, so Frank Lloyd Wright joins a trend that already uh, existed and was kind of in full swing. But uh, Wright's real contribution here, I think, was to explore what a solar house might mean in terms of uh, symbolic form or, you know, kind of expressive form. So he thought that a solar house should be in the shape of a semicircle, hemicycle, um, because the sun, you know, carves a circular path through the sky throughout the day, and so the house should respond uh, to that. So this was um, a really kind of poetic uh, investigation of what the solar house might mean. By the way, the client, Herb Jacobs, uh, who came to write 
didn't ask for a solar house. Uh, Wright enjoyed, you know, kind of foisting uh, different ideas on different clients. But in fact, uh, Jacobs became Wright's biggest champion, and I, I wrote three or four books about Wright uh, later on. So they loved this house and lived in it the rest of their life. Again, Wright, Wright is in step with everything uh, that remains kind of first principles today. So all the glass is on the south. There's proper uh, shading uh, provided by the overhang above. It's actually a two-level uh, glass wall here. Um, he has a concrete floor and radiant uh, it had a hot water radiant floor system. And it's in great uh, condition today. The, cur the current owners are only the third owners, and they uh, welcomed me. And I, uh, it's a very, very powerful house in just in terms of experience, because the sun, as the sun moves across the sky, it, it you know, it's kind of traces its way across the floor plan, and the back. It, it's very strongly oriented. There's the back wall is in the earth. And so you're always, you're, you're made very, very aware of the dark side and the light side and the hot side and the cold side and so on and so forth. So uh, Wright really contributed another higher level of artistic thinking, I think. And we could go on and on and on with this. There were uh, other people involved in exploring different new techniques. Arthur Brown worked down in Arizona, and he developed uh, the first uh, what is called uh, a sun space. He didn't use that term. Um, but a sun space is a south-facing uh, room that is um, going to overheat and overcool. It's going to fluctuate outside of the comfort zone, but it's really going to act as a buffer or barrier to the rooms behind it, which will then be, and, and the back wall is a thermal mass, a concrete wall, to store heat and then radiate it back to the rooms behind uh, at night. And this, this worked very well and became uh, a very typical thing in the 19. 70s and, and remains a, a very valid technique uh, today. And Brown called this uh, a storage wall. It would store up the heat of the sun during the day and release it at night. Again, like Ka uh, the, all of these uh, pioneering people uh, through the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, really had a, a very conscious, critical position about how buildings should use energy. And energy was cheap at this time. It was either a vice president or a secretary of something in the 19, early 1950s said, we shouldn't even bother to uh, meter electricity because it was so cheap. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, and by the way, these are not liberal hippie people. I mean, these are, these are very pragmatic um, mainstream people, but maybe the, the thing that really connected them was that they were uh, raised in the Great Depression. I th there was kind of an, just an ethic of, of frugality that, uh, that was born probably back in the 1930s. There were, and throughout the book I, I detail this, there were various periods where there was a, a real uh, sense of scarcity uh, from time to time. So the economic context is a big part of this, and, and a, a reason that, that the solar house was a very popular concept in the 1940s was um, that there was this notion that um, fossil fuels were being uh, depleted or the, in this case, by wartime uh, demand, of course. So there's this kind of clear connection between the, the, the economic perceptions of the time and the, and the public interest. There was lots of public interest. You can see the date here. <laughs>
1944, and this is Fred Kack, and the article is mostly about Kack. So the, the, again, widespread, uh, popular concept. Okay, now kind of changing gears from the world of the architects and the passive type of solar house to what the engineers were doing at the very same time in terms of inventing ways of mechanically capturing solar heat, storing it, and uh, distributing it. So the, the passive and the active um, types of solar houses were developed absolutely in parallel, um, but without much interaction or communication, at least at, at the beginning. So a fellow named Hoyt Hoddle at MIT uh, built this house in 1939, although he didn't call it a solar house. It's only called that kind of in retrospect. Um, he was uh, a chemical engineer. Um, and so this was not at all a architectural proposition. He just had this idea that um, you could heat a structure using flat plate collectors on the roof that would be basically a piece of glass and then a um, coil uh, of water behind that glass that would heat up and then you can store the hot water uh, in a tank in the house and run, in this case, run just run air over the surface of the tank and heat the house. Uh, and he was right. This house was 100% solar heated for an entire year. Uh, a little bit like hitting a home run your first time at, at bat, I think. Um, and so this was the, the, the first time this was ever thought of and done. Well, the idea of the panels existed before. People were using, people were using flat plate collectors to heat um, like their bathing water uh, commonly in the 1920s, but nobody had ever done it for space heating before. Um, and so this, this uh, became a, a kind of proven technology right away, although it was not anything like economically feasible, and that um, Hoddle acknowledged that. And so different engineers are starting to experiment with different uh, types of these active systems. George Luff uh, graduated from MIT and then uh, came to Colorado and built uh, houses. His, this one in Boulder has flat plate collectors, but instead of heating water, it heated air and stored the heat from that air in a big gravel uh, bed in the basement. Uh, that also worked pretty well and air and gravel type systems became popular in the 1970s. MIT uh, went on kind of refining the, the hot water type of systems. In their third house, they moved the tank from the basement uh, to the attic, and they changed the angle uh, of the collectors because now they were, the, in the first house, they collected heat all year round. Uh, in this house, they were only trying to collect heat during the day for that. It was a 24-hour thing. Um, but this worked, too. Again, it worked scientifically, but not anything um, uh, close to working economically uh, because energy was so cheap and the, the parts were not um, commercialized, of course. One of the first collaborations between an engineer and an architect in terms of the active solar house was this one. Eleanor Raymond, a Boston architect, and Maria Telkas from the MIT program uh, built a solar house where the heat was stored in uh, a phase change material, salt, essentially, uh, that would melt and um, solidify, and melt and solidify, and that, that um, is able to capture uh, much higher amounts of energy than water uh, alone. Um, but again, it's, it's not a really resolved work uh, of architecture. It looks a bit, these were science projects and they tended to look like science projects. 
So part of what I try to unpack and interpret in the book is this idea that there is, uh, the, the architects are doing one thing and the engineers are doing another and they need to, they, well, they figure out themselves that they need to cooperate and talk to each other. Keck uh, and his brother uh, were known as Keck and Keck and they were asked, why didn't you do, ever do active solar? Um, and they said, well, it, uh, it requires a lot of electricity to pump that stuff around and fans to move the air. This was all kind of part of the discourse. But finally in 1950, MIT holds uh, a conference and they invite all the people working on solar from the engineering community and all of these solar architects and said, Let, let's come together and present our work to each other. And the conclusion of this conference was that um, architects and engineers have to learn how to work together. Um, so that was a big moment in, in, in my story. And this idea that architects and engineers don't speak the same language is a, a, a long time problem <clears throat> in the discipline. And, and my book kind of, I, I think, contributes to how we understand that the schism, if you will. Again, there's uh, the, the economic context uh, is really uh, important here when um, President Truman put together the Paley Commission and said, look at the nation's resources and our future. And they, the, again, these are not liberal guys, um, but they came back and said, we're gonna need a lot of solar houses in the future. Um, so the economic context is always there in the background. George Luff built, a, a, well, this is an example of uh, healing the schism or an architect and an engineer working very sympathetically together. So George Luff in his next house engaged an architect, Richard Hunter. Um, so this was both an active and a passive house. Again, it collected hot air in panels on the roof and stored, them in, stored the heat in gravel. But Hunter figured out that that gravel, so the gravel is in those tall red tubes. Hunter, once he understood that that was the principal uh, thing going on in the house, he said, I want to put that on display and celebrate it. So those tubes are right there in the, inside the front door in the main staircase and they're painted bright red. And I think this is the first time a solar engineering feature was really celebrated. Uh, by an architect, so a very, very beautiful example of uh, coordination. <clears throat> uh, again, these people were not radicals, but they had an attitude and they had foresight and, uh, and most of them had been raised in the Great Depression. Through the 50s, more experiments, more examples of cooperation, collaboration, and lots of interest. This, uh, the first, um, conference of the, this is the Americans for the Advancement of Solar Energy, which is now ASES, um, but their first meeting ever had a thousand people uh, uh, attend the, the dinner here and the keynote speaker said, we realize as never before that our fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas will not last forever. Um, just again, illustrating the popularity of this, there was an open competition for a solar house in Phoenix in 1957. 1,500 architects registered from, from 32 nations. The winner happened to be a student. <clears throat> but this house was built in Phoenix and it worked very well and it's, uh, it's actually still there. And so more experimentation through the late 50s and 60s, we start to see eccentric shaped uh, architecture, but these are all representing collaborations between the architect and the engineers. <clears throat> there were also in the 60s, a lot of kind of lone wolf uh, type inventors, mad scientist types, and there's a, a chapter about those folks in my book too. So, all of that is kind of what sets the stage for the 1970s when we um, uh, 
saw a, a real explosion in solar architecture. But n none of this would have been possible if we hadn't learned those things in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. And we shouldn't snicker about the solar architecture of the 1970s, even though it might kind of look funny to us. Or maybe it's coming around to look attractive to us again now. Um, but we did very, very well. So where are we uh, today? Well, certainly experimentation continues and needs to continue. And architects and engineers need to continue to learn how to collaborate better. But based, by the way, this is an, just a generic image, but it's a, it's a house in Maine um, that uses zero energy. Uh, on an annual basis, both by using passive, good passive design of the Keck type and active systems. Um, so the technical issues, even though you know we need to continue to experiment and make better panels and things like that, the technical issues are well understood. Zero energy is completely feasible, even in a severe climate. Houses, by the way, houses in Sweden Ordinary houses built to building minimum building codes require the equivalent of a hair dryer uh, to heat. Um, so the the technical ch challenges are not the problem uh, any longer. I invite you to discuss and consider that you know if the technical if the technology is not the problem, what is the problem? Um, so we, we can do a lot better today. Um, and, uh, but I, I think my, my book hopefully sheds light on how, how we got there. Um, in addition to the book, I built kind of a website to promote the book. It's called solarhousehistory.com. So if you want to learn a little bit more, uh, you can visit there. I had a lot of content that I had to leave out of the book, so I've been including that. I've been blogging here, and it, it's, quite, uh, it's quite fun. But I, I, I think the website has quite a bit of, of information uh, on its own. Thank you. Uh, what is the passive house standard for the amount of uh, solar, pardon me, southern facing glass for passive solar gain? Do you see? Houses in Sweden with walls and walls of glass? Uh, I can't tell you there's a standard because it depends on your climate and it depends on the wall construction, roof and floor construction, but it also depends on the type of glass. We now have much better glass than Keck did, even though he did have triple pane glass. Uh, our, just, our methods of making glass window units are much better. So. Uh, but the implication of your question is correct. We, if you do everything else right, and by the way, f solar is not the first thing you do. The first thing you do is insulate, uh, super insulate. So if you, if you super insulate and you have very airtight construction, um, you actually don't need so much glass on the south as, as Keck needed. Um, you know, I, in, in Laramie, I think it's about, um, I think the optimum on the south is uh, about 25% window to wall ratio. Um, but that number will vary um, depending on your location and depending on your construction type. But Keck was using like 50 or 60% glass, and that would be too much. Is there a solar application for cooling? Yes, well, uh, so the first principle is prevent overheating passively by shading, right? That's what we've been talking about. But yes, there uh, are um, systems for solar, they're called solar absorptive coolers. Those were developed in the 70s. They were actually developed at, at uh, CSU in Fort Collins um, by George Luff and his team. He had a team of 18. Uh, researchers in the early 70s. Um, but um, actually what is most effective today is, is to use photovoltaics 
and generate electricity from solar and then just do kind of conventional cooling. The cost of, of photovoltaics has fallen through the floor in the past five years. I don't know if people know about that. Um, uh, a solar panel costs half of what it cost uh, five years ago, I think. Yes? Um, it was interesting to see the, the discussion about where the glass industry was at 50 years ago. And, and where do you see them right now? It's, it's interesting to me, doing architecture and doing passive solar, that so much of what they do is the, the higher insulating glass, and then the glass that's preventing the heat gain in, in the warm climates, and they're capable of optimizing glass for uh, solar heat gain and insulation, but it's not really what's pushed much at, at times. What that is, and what do you see coming? Well, I'm I'm optimistic. So what I see coming is even better windows. That right now, that I think the the you know the 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 people who do what you do, who really want to make uh, super low energy houses, have to buy windows from Germany, right? Um, the the American companies are kind of behind. I, I'm sure it's just a simple supply and demand type of function. Um, but um, again, it's more of a cultural issue than a technological issue. So we need people like you pushing the culture. 